welcome to the Elite West History Blog by the Consulate General of Switzerland in Chicago. I'm Jörg Oberschli. Today we have a very special guest, Sam Holkart. Sam, who are you? Well, who am I? Um, I was born in Switzerland. A fairly typical you know, environment. My um, mother encouraged us to um, play instruments. And so at the age of 10, um, I started taking drum lessons. And it was like a completely different experience. Here I come to the first class, and Chester, a very nice, kind uh, man, shows me how to set up the drum set. And he explains like a simple rhythm, you know, like a 4-4, four, four, and we're practicing boom, chak, boom, chak. And after 50 minutes, the doorbell rings, and um, I get up and I say goodbye, Mr. Gill. And he says, no, 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 hold on, hold on. I'm just uh, sit where you are, and um, he opens the door, and the next guy is a trombone player. So Chester says to the trombone player, "Okay, we're gonna play Tin Roof Blues," and he puts the sheet music in front of the guy. Chester sits at the piano, and he tells me, "You're just playing the rhythm I showed you: one, two, one, two, three, four, check, check, and." Uh, just to explain, like, I, I played, I practiced the violin for four years and never felt I, or three years, never felt I played music. And here, after one hour, I, I played music. And I always say this planted the seed in my heart um, that, I did, that I didn't know was there, but um, that sort of started to blossom. No clue that anything would happen. I just went to a gig he was playing near Basel. I could kind of tell that Sonny Land was a bit unhappy, that there were so few people. He sat at the bar and it was eight o'clock and we didn't play. So I kind of went up to him and I said, you know, are you going to play? And um, we started a conversation. I told him I played with Eddie Boy. And he goes, Eddie Boy, that's my partner. We used to roam Highway 61 and blah, blah, blah. He's telling me all these stories about Eddie Boy. And then um, he goes, so what you playing, boy? And I said, um, I play the drums. And there happened to be a set of drums in the club. So he goes, let's get busy. <laughs> so I started playing the drum set. And he played the piano. And we played two nights in a row. I mean, we played. He had two gigs. Um, uh, two nights in a row at the same place. And um, the second night, a friend of mine recorded the event. And uh, many years later, we published this CD uh, it's entitled uh, Live in Europe. And at some point, Sunland turned to the audience and goes, ladies and gentlemen, um, give the drummer a nice round of applause. Kind of seems like he's got into my life. At that point, I had no clue, you know, I would ever end up here in Chicago playing with him for 13 years. I began to play piano at a very early age. He told me that um, his neighbor had a har harmonium, so like a little pump organ. And um, what Sunny Land did um, was she let him practice a little bit, but not enough. And so what he did, he took a shoebox and copied the keys, white and black, onto the shoebox so that at home he could practice how to play the piano. He would talk about his like early influences, and there are all these guys, you know, that um, that um, never recorded and are sort of lost to history because. They, they didn't leave a mark, in a way, with a recording, but they sort of live on, like one guy was the Grey Ghost, and one guy was Lockjar. I mean, they had the most fantastic names. And then his sort of first chance at a job, I mean, when he ran away at 13, he basically would he'd pick cotton, he did menial, mostly menial jobs. But at, in the, at the same time, he sort of, 
gained a lot of experience by hanging with established musicians, listening to them, and then afterward, you know, after they were done playing, get on the piano and start playing himself. And um, his first sort of paying job that I know of, I, I don't know if it was the first job, but one he talked about was he played at a movie house. Um, and he played during the break when they were changing the reels just to entertain the people. Mm -hmm. so. There's a story surrounding uh, the song Low Down Sunnyland Train that it affected him deeply. Yeah. Um, there was a train in the south called the Sunnyland. And, um, you know, the trains had names. I think there was the Sunflower and Sunnyland and the, the Sonto Special and the Vicksburg. And sometimes it was like uh, 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 the destination, the final destination of the train. Um, in this particular case, it's, I think, a, a, a stretch of uh, landscape, and it was called the Sunny Land. And the Sunny Land, you know, back then, basically, the trains run through the country, and the road crosses the railroad tracks. But there are no barriers, there's no nothing, you know. And um, people got killed by trains, and this happened quite frequently. And Sunny Land was relating the story that um, a white family and then a black family got killed at the same railroad crossing in uh, subsequent weeks. And um, he told me hearing about that gave me a tender heart, which I always thought was a most beautiful expression. He made his way to Chicago and he was going to make the first recording with Jess Brothers. Leonard Jess asked Sonny um, uh, if he was interested in recording and he said yes. And he had recorded before and so for this session he really wanted Lonnie Johnson on guitar but Lonnie Johnson was not available so he asked his wife and his wife said why don't you get Muddy. So there's a story that at the time Buddy was working as a delivery truck driver, yep. and Sunnyland had to get him off work yeah. with a little white lie, so the yeah. two of them could go and record. Exactly. So, so Money Waters is delivering Venetian blinds. <laughs> That's his job, you know. And um, so we're, we're talking about the blues musician Money Waters. Yeah, guy. yeah, yeah. I mean, the great Money Waters. You know, you got to start somewhere. Yeah. I mean, you know, he had a family and he needed to pay bills and stuff. So you got to make a living. So he's he's doing this job, and um, Sunny was telling me. So he picked up. He gets in the car. He picks up Big Crawford, the bass player, um, for the session. He picks up the Fat Man, Alfred Wallace, who was the drummer, and then they went to Muddy's job. And Sunny goes to the foreman and tells him, uh, you know, Muddy, Muddy Waters' uh, mother died, and um, the funeral is happening. So. He says, um, I got to pick him up for the funeral. So they pick him up, he gets off, uh, off of work, they pick him up, they get a fifth of whiskey and they hit the studio. And in the studio, Sunnyland, if I'm not mistaken, records four sides at, at, at that session. And at the end of the session, Leonard uh, just turns to Sunnyland and says, can we sing? Pointing with Muddy. And Sunnyland said, he sings like a bird. So then um, Jess says, okay, uh, we'll re record some sides with Muddy. And I think he recorded four sides also with Muddy Waters without Sunny Land. So it's just guitar and, 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 and bass, upright bass and drums. And, you know, that, that's in a way, that's how Muddy Waters got exposed to the Chess Brothers. And it's the beginning of his career. Um, but he did not stay with uh, Chess. Uh, for very long. No, it's actually Sunnyland's only session he recorded for the Chess Brothers. Um, he, I think, was a very fiercely independent soil, soul and he um, really enjoyed working with lots and lots of different people. Sunnyland had an incident where uh, 
he was injured. Can you tell us a little bit about that? It was in the late 70s, he got stabbed in his left arm and it sort of cut some of his muscle a little bit. And so for a while he had a bit of a hard time playing fluid bass lines. In, in some ways his, his sort of sense and his mastery as a musician um, also told him um, just play what you can. And to me it was almost like um, for people who know what Kirsch is, it's a, like a Swiss brandy, a distillate from, from cherries. Mm -hmm. And um, it's almost it, 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 like every brandy, you know, it's pretty heavy. Yeah. And um, it's kind of like taking a Kirsch and distill it again. So you get the essence of the essence in a way. I mean, that's what his playing was to me at the end. And Sonny Lamp was a, like an unbelievable singer. I mean, he could sing without even words, just moan. And you would, after a, a, a full chorus, you would buy a used car from him. No question asked. I mean, just unbelievable. That piece of music became a celebration of African American, of, of, of black music in the United States. And so George put together this incredible band, which consisted of a blues band, a barbershop uh, quartet, um, I think a gospel choir, and um, a jazz band, a full big band. So George came to blues where we were playing every Sunday night to hear Sunday night. And George loved what he heard. So George understood, you know, you can't like Sunday night can't read music or whatever. Um, you can't write something out for him, so let him play a blues. And Sterling, Sterling Plump, a, a Chicago um, poet, wrote lyrics for the tunes. And um, there was a um, rehearsal at UFI. And um, I took Sonny and I picked him up and um, brought him to the rehearsal and he was not very happy because rehearsing was like a word he was not familiar with. He didn't really like to do this. He played and that was it. So the premiere of this oeuvre, um, comes and we're in Grand Park on the stage of Praterio Bancho. And I sat behind Sunny Land to give him, to poke him in the back when he's had to play. I mean, because um, he wanted to make sure that he didn't miss. Um, and so I knew from George, you know, where it was. And so I'm sitting there and the moment comes, I poke him in the back, and Sonny Lance starts playing this blues, just stone blues. And um, he got a standing ovation. People loved it. And then there's a, a side story to it. At the end of the whole thing, there was like a big finale where everybody's singing. And um, I think half the people who were singing missed the cue and it just sounded a little weak yeah. let's say it that way and george without batting an eye let them finish and then goes back to 41 <laughs> and everybody comes in and sings the ending like it was meant to be and it sounded like it was written that way wow. it was unbelievable marked the 25th anniversary of his passing. What were the most memorable moments uh, in your life and your relationship 
with Sonny Lane? Well, you know, I don't know if you know, I, I knew him for 20 years, and um, it, it's amazing. Sonny Lane was 50 years my senior from a completely different cultural background. And yet, you know, there, it, 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 it was really an amazing friendship. I mean, it was, he was my mentor in a way, but we were also friends. At some point he called me every day. We didn't work together. So if we had a gig that night, he didn't call, or if we saw each other, uh, he didn't call, but other than that, he called every day, and he called around six o'clock because he knew I was, you know, working sometimes and out and about. And then, if I wasn't at home, sometimes he'd leave a message and he'd call, "Hey man, this is Sunny Night Slam. Just call him to call you, <laughs> just <laughs> like that." So it was always great, and um, I would call him back and we chat for a little bit. And when he passed away, um, like a month or so into it. I, I was I came home and it was around six o'clock and I felt extremely blue. And all of a sudden I realized it's that phone call, you know, that's not there anymore. So it's a lot of the little things. I just um, you know, I have a lot of really great memories and, and um I am just so enormously grateful um that I met him and that I had the opportunity to play in his band. And um, that we became such good friends. Sam, this has been most interesting and invigorating conversation. Thank you so much for being our guest. Thank you for watching. And until our next uh, Midwest History Vlog, goodbye.